on World News Tonight. Explosive tensions, escalating rifts between global superpowers lead way to alarming reports. Nuclear talks, Iran back on the bargaining table as international restraints are discussed. Expanding drive, France fights the pandemic with the assistance of a brand new Covid drug. Countdown begins, the world celebrates 100 days till glory at the Beijing Winter Games. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. On today's coverage, we start off with alarming developments on China's military front. The United States has reported alarming updates on a hypersonic weapons test carried out by China recently, claiming the renewed military activity is concerning. Top U.S. military officer General Mark Milley provided the first official U.S. confirmation of what he called a, quote, very concerning Chinese hypersonic weapons test that military experts say appears to show Beijing's pursuit of an Earth-orbiting system designed to evade American missile defenses. The Pentagon has been at pains to avoid direct confirmation of the Chinese test this summer, first reported by the Financial Times, even as President Joe Biden and other officials have expressed general concerns about Chinese hypersonic weapons development. Last week, U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin declined to comment directly on that report. Thanks for asking the question, but I'm not going to comment on those specific reports. In an interview, Milley explicitly confirmed a test and said it was very close to a Sputnik moment, referring to Russia's launch of the first man-made satellite which put Moscow ahead in the Cold War era space race. Hypersonic weapons are difficult to defend against because they fly at lower altitudes than ballistic missiles but can achieve more than five times the speed of sound, robbing adversaries of reaction time and traditional defeat mechanisms. China's foreign ministry denied a weapons test. It said it had carried out a routine test in July, but added it was not a missile, it was a space vehicle. The United States and Russia have both tested hypersonic weapons. U.S. President Joe Biden supports imposing a new billionaire tax and the White House believes the democratic proposal would be legal. This action is considered in order to help finance President Joe Biden's social policy and climate change agenda. Tonight, the urgent scramble by Democrats to reach agreement on President Biden's multi-trillion dollar spending plans that he wants to have finalized before he leaves for his high-stakes trip to Europe tomorrow. Everybody With top negotiators shuttling back and forth between the White House and Capitol Hill, Democratic leaders struck an optimistic note. But there are still a slew of unresolved issues between moderates and progressives, including how to pay for it. Now, a newly suggested billionaire's tax that would tax the revenue of those who earn $100 million or more in three consecutive years, targeting the 700 wealthiest Americans, including Amazon's Jeff Bezos and Tesla's Elon Musk. But there are questions over whether it is constitutional, and key moderate Joe Manchin is already blasting it, while other Democrats are raising questions about what could be cut out. Tonight, we learned negotiators have dropped paid leave from the package. Iran has agreed to resume nuclear talks with Western powers and China before the end of November, with the exact date to be revealed next week. This is according to a tweet put out by the country's chief nuclear negotiator. Iran agreed to come back to the negotiating table with six world powers, reviving hopes of a landmark nuclear deal. That's according to Iran's top nuclear negotiator after meeting with EU officials in Brussels. On Wednesday, Ali Bagheri Khani tweeted, quote, had a very serious and constructive dialogue with Enrique Mora on the essential elements for successful negotiations. We agree to start negotiations before the end of November. Talks on Geneva had stalled after the election of Iran's hardline president, Ibrahim Raisi, in June. Raisi is expected to take a tougher approach with the West. Iranian Foreign Minister Hossein Amir Abdolian on Wednesday said U.S. President Joe Biden needed to demonstrate his commitment to negotiations. Spearheaded by American diplomats in 2015, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, or JCPOA, lifted global sanctions on Iran in exchange for limits on Tehran's nuclear program. Three years later, Republican President Donald Trump quit the deal and imposed new sanctions. 
Iran then resumed enriching uranium beyond limits set by the JCPOA. Under Democratic President Joe Biden, the U.S. has called for a return to the deal, but Iran has insisted on sanctions relief first. U.S. Special Envoy for Iran Robert Malley said earlier this week that efforts to revive the pact were at a, quote, critical phase, and Tehran's reasons for avoiding talks were wearing thin. In Kabul's main children's hospital, the crumbling of Afghanistan's health system can be seen in the eyes of exhausted staff who have remained in the city, eking out their fast diminishing stocks of medicines. This is the main children's hospital in Kabul, where medical staff are squeezing three babies into a single incubator because they don't have enough supplies. Nurses who once took care of three or four babies each are now having to look after 20 or more to make up for the absence of staff who fled the country when the Taliban seized power in August. The medical team has not been paid in months and often struggle even to pay their car fare to work. Mawa is the nursing supervisor in the nursery ward. Our request for the current government is to increase the number of our staff because every nurse is usually responsible for about four children. And now, due to a lack of staff, every nurse is taking care of 24 children. The workload is too much. Although the number of patients have fallen since the fighting ended, Afghanistan's hospitals are grappling with the fallout of its rapidly spreading economic crisis. UN agencies say as much as 95% of the population does not regularly have enough to eat. Meanwhile, the lack of support from a $600 million project administered by the World Bank has left thousands of facilities unable to buy supplies and pay salaries. Dr. Mohamed Latif Behev, the assistant director of Indira Gandhi Children's Hospital, said officials from UNICEF have given some help but more is needed to fill the shortages of medicine. We're facing problems with our staff payments. And the other problem that we're facing in this hospital is the shortage of medicine and the shortage of food for malnourished children. For mothers like Azu, they just want to save their children. She has already lost one of her five children to malnourishment-related illness and is unwilling to lose another. France announced that it will bar British fishing boats from some French ports starting next week if no deal is reached with the UK in a dispute over fishing licenses and suggest it suggested it may restrict energy supplies to Channel Islands as well. A new war of words in a fishing dispute Paris is seething at the lack of progress from London in getting French fishermen the licenses they need to fish in British waters. Tensions over a post-Brexit deal could now result in sanctions from Paris. Our patience is reaching its limits. There's an obvious desire which was expressed to not respect the deal and to not give our fishermen, who have been very patient, who have waited for a long time, who have been exemplary, the licenses they are entitled to. Concretely, France is threatening to step up border and sanitary tracks on British goods, prevent British fishing boats from accessing certain French ports, and to beef up checks on lorries coming and going from the UK. The French Maritime and European Affairs Ministries said in a joint statement that a second round of measures is being prepared. France is not ruling out reviewing its power supply to the UK. The UK's Brexit minister, Lord Frost, tweeted a government statement saying that France's threats were disappointing and disproportionate and not what you'd expect from a close ally and partner. That statement said, the measures being threatened do not appear to be compatible with the post-Brexit trade and cooperation agreement and wider international law. The dispute centres on the issuance of licences to fish in territorial waters 6 to 12 nautical miles off Britain's shores and around the Channel Islands. France has been especially angered by the rejection of French boats in waters around Guernsey and Jersey, right next to the French mainland. The flare-up over fishing is just one of a series of disagreements between London and Paris. Diplomatic relations between the two countries are at their lowest point in decades. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news.
Welcome back. There is some good news for the United States in the battle against COVID. Number of cases have plummeted across the country, but still doubts arise as the holiday season is nearing. After a roller coaster pandemic so far, tonight more positive signs. New COVID cases in the U.S. are down 57 percent since their last peak on September 1st and 16 percent over the past week. Hospitalizations have dropped 54 percent since late August. We are now heading in the right direction, and but with cases still high, we must remain vigilant heading into the colder, drier winter months. But while there is improvement across the country, a few areas with low vaccination rates are still hot spots. Billings Clinic in Montana hopes its caseload is plateauing. Still, it's urging caution over the winter as more Americans gather for the holidays. We're very worried about what's going on currently, and we're worried that it could get worse. A bright spot, though, the possibility that younger kids may soon get vaccinated if the CDC signs off as early as next week. Some states are already planning ahead. New York's governor says she does not anticipate needing mass vaccination sites, instead relying on pediatrician offices and local pharmacies. Parents have been waiting for this, schools have been waiting for this, and this is really a breakthrough. France has ordered 50,000 doses of Merck and Co's experimental COVID-19 antiviral drug for adults, the country's health minister Olivier Viren told a hearing at the French Senate. Alongside the vaccine, perhaps the best weapon against COVID-19. This orange capsule is molnupiravir, a medication developed in the United States by the Merck laboratory. France has already placed an order, even though the European Medicines Agency has not yet approved it. Delivery is expected within a month. France moved very early on this. We have already placed a pre-order. 50,000 doses of this medication will be delivered to France. The antiviral treatment is highly effective, according to Merck. Clinical trials show that molnupiravir halved the risk of hospitalization and death. It also has a significant size advantage. It's the first anti-COVID medication to be available in capsule form. It's reserved for patients who have tested positive but have not yet been hospitalized. The vast majority of medications against COVID-19 are intravenous, which requires a hospital environment. This is a pill which you swallow, it's easy to use, it's easy to store and to distribute, which is extremely important. The medication inhibits the virus from reproducing itself in the body, which slows down the disease. The cost of the medication has not yet been specified in France, but the US government paid around 600 euros per dose. Merck says it has also begun testing on contact cases. India has rejected calls to announce a net zero carbon emissions target and said it was more important for the world to lay out a pathway to reduce such emissions and avert dangerous rising global temperatures. Let's cross over to Abhi Dharana World News Pressure Correspondent Gayatri Gunasekara reporting from Delhi in India for more. Gayatri. Yes, Shenali. Environment Secretary Rameshwar Prasad Gupta stated that announcing net zero was not the solution to the climate crisis. Representatives of nearly 200 countries will meet in Glasgow, Scotland for climate talks to strengthen action to tackle global warming under 2015 Paris Agreement. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi will attend the conference as a show of how the country is taking climate change seriously. India has committed to cutting the emissions intensity of its GDP by 33 to 35 percent by 2030 from 2005 levels, achieving a 24 percent reduction by 2016. Some environment experts say India could consider lowering its emissions intensity by as much as 40 percent dependent on finances, whether it has access to newer technologies. But India's dependence on coal, it's the world's second largest consumer of the fossil fuel and the vast uh, reserves is likely to continue. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adha Dharana World News Special Correspondent Gayatri Gunasekara reporting from Delhi in India. We have some good news for you. British conservationists say protecting the peatlands of northern England could be a quick and easy solution to slowing climate change. Could protecting Britain's peatlands be pivotal in its fight to slow climate change? Conservationist Christopher Dean believes so. It's as important as keeping this in the ground uh, here as it is important not 
mining coal and putting coal back into the atmosphere. Peatlands take carbon dioxide, or CO2, out of the atmosphere as the vegetation on top builds plant structures and carbon settles in the layers of peat, which have developed over thousands of years. Rising global temperatures are drying them out, making them susceptible to wildfires and turning what should be carbon sinks into carbon sources. Dean and his team are constructing dams in natural gullies to stop the moorland from drying out and eroding. They are also planting sphagnum moss, which holds 20 times its own weight in water to keep the peat moist. Dean is confident this could be an easy fix. So if we invest in turning this landscape into good ecological condition, it will take CO2 out of the atmosphere for us, lock it up in the peat, and it will be a fantastic good news story for climate change. And it's, it's something that we could do very quickly. In England's marshy fenlands, a pilot project is testing new types of sustainable crops that can grow in re-wetted peatlands. The Waterworks project is run by the Wildlife Trust, alongside scientists and academics from the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology and from the University of East London. Lorna Parker is the project's restoration manager. Uh, so what we're trying to do here is demonstrate a new way that we could farm peat soils that will still bring in an economic income for farmers, but actually trap that carbon in the soil with a new form of crops. The team hope that sustainable crops, such as wild celery, typha and reeds, can be used in a range of industries, including food, construction and medicine. The World Bank halted disbursements for operations in Sudan in response to the military seizure of power from a transitional government, while state oil company workers, doctors and pilots joined civilian groups opposing the takeover. Another day of protest action and barricades in Sudan as security forces launched sweeping arrests of anti-coup protesters aiming to tighten the grip of the regime. It follows General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan's statements earlier on Tuesday defending the military seizure of power from the Joint Civilian Military Council, saying he ousted the government to avoid civil war. In the northeastern city of Atbara, men, women and children chanted, calling for the military to cede power and to free protesters. But the streets of the capital Khartoum were left empty as locals stayed away amidst a nationwide civil strike. The international community meanwhile banded together to condemn the takeover, largely viewed as having undone two years of progress since the 2019 toppling of autocrat Omar al-Bashir. In a serious blow to the military on Wednesday, the African Union suspended Sudan, while the World Bank froze aid to the country, having previously allocated $2 billion to economic reforms under Prime Minister Abdallah Hamdok. However, Sudan's ambassador to Washington, Nur al-Din Sati, called for even more pressure from global powers. It's never enough, you know, to sway away uh, uh, some military elements who are with their greed for power and for wealth. Uh, I think more is needed, and that's what we are advocating for. What you have done uh, is good uh, for the time being, uh, but you should, uh, should uh, continue doing more. Uh, not only in economic terms, but in diplomatic terms and in political terms. Despite the chaos, people lined up outside airline ticket offices on Wednesday as flights in and out of Khartoum resumed, just one day after authorities said they would be suspended until the end of October. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. A Paris museum handed back cultural artifacts that were looted from modern-day Benin during the colonial era, setting a precedent that will pressure other institutions to return stolen works. The Hyundai Ioniq 5 and Kia EV6 have been awarded top titles at this year's German Car of the Year awards. A jury of 20 monitors journalists evaluated the most important new automotive releases of the year in terms of product features, relevance and future viability. Four Pakistani police were killed and hundreds wounded when armed activists from a banned Islamist group clashed with security forces at an anti-blasphemy demonstration near the eastern city of Lahore. The gun that actor Alec Baldwin fired on a set of his movie Rust, killing one person and injuring another, wasn't properly checked according to officials and a new court filing.
And finally tonight, Chinese Vice Premier Hang Zeng attended the ceremony of the 100-day countdown to the Beijing 2022 Winter Olympic Games and unveiled the Olympic medals named Tongjing, which means together as one for the Winter Games. Hang, also a member of the Standing Committee of the Political Bureau of the Communist Party of China Central Committee and head of a leading group for the 24th Winter Olympic Games, joined Olympic champions Yang Yang and Zhang Yufei in unveiling the Olympic medals at a ceremony in Beijing. The river side of the medal has the Beijing 2022 emblem at its heart, with the official name of the games carved in Chinese below. The surrounding rings mimic star trials, with 24 dots representing the 24th edition of the Olympic Winter Games. The general picture, which resembles a celestial map, carries the wish that athletes will achieve excellence and shine like stars at the Games. The 100-day countdown to the Beijing 2022 Winter Olympic Games was an important milestone in the preparations for the Games, marking that all preparations have entered the sprint stage. The Beijing 2022 Olympic Winter Games will take place from February 4th to February 20th, followed by the Paralympic Games. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Anuradhi will be back tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shinali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.